want to thank Paul for leading the song about fellowship. That is going to be our issue that we're going to be addressing tonight. We're going to be looking at it. I want to thank Michael for the reading. We're going to be out of Acts chapter 2. He read a very familiar passage that we look at all the time, but I want to look at it a little bit closer tonight. Before we begin in that, we're going to back up a few verses from where Michael started. We know what's going on in Acts chapter 2. Mark, you got me really hot over here. How about now? Great, perfect, perfect. What's happening in Acts chapter 2 prior to these verses? We see Peter's sermon, and we see him preaching, and he reaches the point, and he makes it very poignant to the Jews there that this Jesus whom you crucified is now both Lord and Savior. And their response is what? It says, what must we do? It says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And we see right here the establishment of the church, the beginning of the church. And what was just read started in verse 42, but I want to look at verse 41. Go to 41, it says, Then those who gladly received the word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. In our introduction here, I want to notice this. Who were these individuals? These individuals were, were people that readily accepted God's word. And what modifier is used? Gladly. These are convicted people. These are people who are entering into a new system. I want you to think about that for a second. When we go out into the world now and we study with individuals, we know what the church looks like. We've seen it. We've had family members in it for generations. This was day zero of the Lord's church. This was an exciting time, wasn't it? And we have these individuals who gladly receive the word, and it's interesting of all the steps of salvation pointed out, look at what it said, is those who gladly receive the word, they were baptized. And this is where the thrust of our lesson is going. About 3,000 souls were added to them. What is the them? What are we talking about with them? We know it's the church. But we can use this idea of church, and we can look at words that we use more readily today, such as family. Or the word that I want to use tonight, the idea of community. In Portland, Texas, we have a community, you, me, all of us together, we are part of the Lord's body. We are a community within ourselves. We are a portion of the greater community that is the Lord's church universal. And the question that I look at this here and I, and I ask myself is, how do we, as the community here in Portland, how do we grow? How do we advance? How do we build ourselves up? How do we edify? How do we become the strongest that we can be here in Portland? And really, I feel the recipe for that is found in the verses that Michael read. And so what I want to look at, I want to look at 12 points tonight. Yes, 12. So get ready. They're not long ones. But if you're taking notes, this is what I'd suggest. Divide your paper into three portions. The first column over here, 1 through 12. The second column, I'll give you the point. And then the third column will be the example of that point if you want to take notes. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look and we're going to see how each of these points in this passage that Michael read, is going to build up our community here, the church here in Portland. So let's begin. Verse 42, it starts with, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. It's not that it was the apostles, because what had been given to them was by Christ. They were simply carrying on the doctrine of Christ. And look at how it's described. This is not some half-hearted, um, um, heart not in it approach. That's not a phrase, but we're going to go with it. Let's do that. But look what it says. And they continued. And continued is an interesting word. If you look at it in the Greek, it means the same as I am. What do you mean? It means the very existence. It doesn't mean like, oh yeah, I do it. You know, It's like, it is my being. It was not that they just continued in it, but from the Greek it says that their very existence was the Apostles' Doctrine, and how did they continue in it? How did they live in that? How did they exist in it? Steadfastly. They were strongly resolute that they would stay true to that doctrine that was given by Jesus Christ. And I think sometimes in local congregations, we worry a lot about that, and we miss the other points. It's important to know doctrine. I'm not saying that it's not. But sometimes we think we've got it right, and everything else, everybody should just figure it out and get over here. But that's what I want to look at tonight. And what's interesting, too, 
is in these 12 points, five of them will refer to the acts of worship. And this is the first one. Doctrine, teaching, preaching, taking God's word and providing it to individuals. A reference to this would be Acts chapter 14, verse 22. I wish I had time to read it, but I don't. But I do want to point out something to you. All of these things that are mentioned here in Acts chapter 2, it's a preview for the rest of the book of Acts. Frankly, it's a preview for the rest of the New Testament. So if you want to know what's going to happen after uh, starting in Acts 3 through the end of the, the entire Bible, here's your layout right there. And so all the examples I'm going to give you, and I please encourage you to look those up at home, all these examples are going to come from Acts, because I'm keeping it easy for you tonight, but I just want you to see that this is a prelude to the rest of the Bible here that we're seeing condensed down in just a handful of verses. So the first thing that we must do to improve our, our congregation here, our community here in Portland, is that we must make sure always that we are not just doing what God said, but rather living in it, steadfastly defending it, staying true to that doctrine each and every day. And that's the first one. Number two, fellowship. We see in verse 42 that after the apostles' doctrine, it says fellowship. Now, I, I thank the elders for putting books out uh, a few weeks ago, a month ago, something like that, on fellowship. I didn't get a chance to get them, which is good, because they got snatched up, and that's good. I'm glad people are hungry for knowledge and wanting to learn more. But fellowship is an interesting word. And I'm not going to get into all the ins and outs of specifics such as that, that, that book had, but I do find it interesting because fellowship has translated different things in the New Testament. Sometimes we just think, of, oh, we're fellowshipping. But it can also mean contribution. It can also mean communion. It can also mean sharing. You know what I like so much about this word fellowship is it's all about the connections. You know? When we talk about the fellowship that we have, we have a deep-rooted need to be connected to somebody. Now, if I came down here and I walked up to James and I did this, what'd he do? Well, y'all can't see, but he shook my hand. You know why? Because it is within us that we have formed connections with individuals. There is a reaching out, and when somebody such as me sticks out my hand to James, he responds with reciprocity and he reaches back. Each of us have connections with everyone in here. Everyone in this auditorium tonight has some type of connection. Now, my question is this. How is your connections with people in this body tonight? In this community, as you look out, are they strong? I mean, are you holding tight to the individuals in this room? Are they strained? Are they broken? And this is something I want you to make a little star by the second point. I want you to think about it later. Ask yourself, are there relationships that are strained among my brothers and sisters in this community here in Portland tonight that I need to work on. Because if we're trying to advance and we're trying to move forward, it's not going to happen with strained relationships. Imagine the imagery of the body if you had a missing finger. If you cut my finger off, 100% of my attention is going to that one you know, finger. We're going to get really worried about it. But even if it's cut even if it's damaged in something like that. It's that same idea with a connection that is damaged or, or, or strained in some way between members. We need to fix that. Because you look at Ephesians chapter 4 in that beautiful idea of the body being sewn together, knitly fit together. Everybody has a job. There is no one who is not important in the Lord's church. And sometimes we need to remember that. Just because there are individuals get up here and speak or sing or pray does not mean that we are of any more value than the individual taking care of the small little tasks that oftentimes go unnoticed. We are part of the entire body. Everyone fulfilling an important role in it. So once again, my question is, how are our connections with one another in this room tonight? And do we need to improve that so that we can grow? Point number three. Point number three and four, they're, very, they're going to be close together, but they deserve to be separated out. We see in verse 42 of Acts chapter 2, after fellowship, in the breaking of bread. We can look over in Acts 20, verse 7. And a lot of times we use this verse just to show that the corporate worship gathered on the first day of the week. But the breaking of bread here, and it's interesting in this passage in 2 
second Acts, there we go, Acts 2, is that there's two breads mentioned here. This one is referring to the Lord's Supper. Once again, second act of worship that we're talking about here in this group. And what I like about the worship aspects in this passage is that it's not like, all right, these are the five things you're supposed to do in worship. Everything is given its own attention in this passage, showing how important it is. Song leading is not important, more important than preaching. Preaching is not more important than the Lord's Supper. It's not more important than the giving. They are all equally important. And the Lord's Supper is brought out here. And why is that so important for community? Because we are here today because of the death of Jesus Christ. And how wonderful that we have a weekly reminder. I mean, you know how it is. You forget things. The Lord and all of His great knowledge is like, I'm going to have to remind these people every week. And so much so that we've imprinted on the table. And it's a wonderful thing that every week we get to have that reminder. How does that improve community when you do that? Because it harnesses our attention. And remember, you know why you're here? Because Jesus died for you. You're here because you have a chance of salvation because Jesus shed His blood for you. He shed His blood for the church in Acts 20, verse 28. You are part of the community that is going to heaven because He shed His blood for us. Now, He shed it for the whole, for everyone. But it only goes for those who are in the church. And so that's why it is so important for us to remember that that is what we have to remember while we're here. The next one is prayer. Like I said, these go together very closely. Chapter 4, verse 31 of Acts talks about the prayer, the power of prayer there. That's a really cool passage if you get a chance to check it out there. But it shows that the New Testament church was a prayerful church. Sometimes we get an idea, we have an opening prayer, prayer number two, closing prayer. At night, opening prayer, second prayer, closing prayer. Now I don't take away from what is said in them, but I want us to always adopt an idea of being prayerful in everything. Before Acts chapter 2, Jesus ascends up into heaven. The angels look at the disciples, turn to apostles, and he said, what are you doing here? Go on. And so they get out of there. And what do they do? They go back, they assemble, and they pray. We need to make sure that if we want to grow as a community here in Portland, we need to pray about things. And there are so many of you individuals that get up here and lead prayers, and I'm in awe of all the things that you can bring to mind And I'm so amazed by that. I'm thankful for that. I just want to make sure that we are a people that don't just pray here or just listen to prayers here, but we do it in our daily lives. Go through Acts. Just Acts. And if you have a smartphone, you can do this super quick and just look up prayer. And then look at what instances prayer was done during. Times of before great endeavors were going to be undertaken times when individuals were in in great suffering, times when uh, joyful occurrences had happened. Basically, pray without ceasing is one of the best verses in the Bible on prayer. Why? Because we are to be a people constantly in prayer. Do you want to grow as a community? Have we prayed about it? Do you want to study with an individual and hope they come to Christ? Have you prayed earnestly about it? We talked about in James chapter 5, verse 16, the effective prayer of The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man does what? Men? Thank you. One more time. What does it do? Let's remember that. Sometimes we think, well, it's just one-sided. No, no, no. A powerful prayer. God hears. He can answer. So let's move on. Number five. We're moving on to verse 43. And the fifth one, this is important. This is fear. And the reference that I look at is chapter 5, verse 11. Now, if you look at chapter 5, you know this one. This is Ananias and Sapphira. We know what's going on. We know what happens to them. Both of them struck down. And what came over the brethren? Fear. There is a part of community. As we work together, as we try to grow together, there is a fear that there will be consequences to walking outside of that doctrine. Remember point number one, doctrine, teaching? There is a fear that there is going to be uh, consequences for when you decide to walk away from God. And that's a very important part of fellowship. It really is. Because if you look, at, and it's twofold, 
Because if you look at Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, especially verse 1, there's two-fold reasons why we go out and we attempt to correct those in error. To help the individual in error, but what else? To help the body. To, as it says, consider your own selves. Because we have to protect this community that we are a part of so that sin does not permeate through it. And an important aspect of fellowship and growth as a community is enacting church discipline. It's not fun. It's not comfortable. It is hard. I've seen it so many times, and it never gets easier. And the individuals that go up, and the times I've seen it here with the elders, none of the elders have ever done it that I've seen without a heavy heart. You can tell they have a heavy heart to do that, but it is part of it. And one point that we have to remember, too, is it does not matter who the individual is, whoever the brother or sister in Christ is. Maybe it's someone that you don't know very well. Maybe it's family. But if they are walking disobedient and contrary to the Word, and they continually spurn the individual rebuke and the rebuke of two or three witnesses, and eventually of that of the church, they are to be withdrawn from. Why? Because that is what the Bible commands. And it's hard. It's not easy. But it's what God tells us that we are to do to preserve the community that we are a part of. Fear with it comes with so many other things as well. An idea of reverence. It's not just the fear of these consequences, but also just, just reverence. You know why these people gladly received the Word and were baptized and did all of these things? Because they had a fear of God. They had a reverential fear of God, and we should too. I think, and as silly as it may sound, just because we don't see Him, I think sometimes that, that we forget how great and mighty He is and how He will be a vengeful God against disobedience. And we must have that fear. That fear helps motivate. Jude, verse 22 and 23, we see that some are saved with compassion, some are saved with fear. And it motivates individuals in different ways. Moving on to verse 44. This is point number six. Verse 44 reads, Now all who believed were together. I know there's more to that verse, but we're going to say that to the next point. Now all who believed were together. What does that mean? They were physically together. And I think with the advent of transportation and expansion and things like that, of, of communities, it's harder now. But there's still a need to be physically close to one another. It is that physical closeness that allows us to be in the lives of of our fellow brothers and sisters so that we know when they need help. That we know when, there's, when someone is down and they need encouragement. When someone may be struggling with something. When someone's had wonderful news and wants to share it with someone. And so physically, being close together is important. And we're going to see there's another one coming a little bit later with that that shows the reason why. But just being involved in people's lives. You know what's interesting? is that in my profession, I get a lot of emails, a lot of emails, a lot of text messages, not so many phone calls. You know what I've learned is that in an email, people will say terrible things to you, terrible things. Texting, they will say marginally terrible things, but it's a whole lot harder for them to call you on the phone and say terrible things. Plenty do, don't worry. But the thing is, is that, and then when you're face to face, it's even harder to do that. Why? Because there is a connection that you have when you're physically in front of someone. And with all the advent of technology, I know a lot of it is for good. I know that's for good. But sometimes I think we have lost the art of conversation. We have lost the ability to speak to one another. And being physically close to one another shows that there is family and community. Just like you when, with your children, you want your children close to you. The same thing is true of this community here in the church family that we have. A reference to this is uh, Acts 4, verse 32. And we keep moving on, and I'm going to finish the verse 44 and move into 45. And it says, And had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. That is point number seven. They divided their goods and they gave. It's part of the idea of fellowship. They shared Communism. No, not communism. Why? Because it was of their own volition. No one made them do it. You know what that tells me about these people? They were generous. 
Because the truth was, the New Testament church had been established. They didn't know, they didn't want to leave. They, they just learned this, and they wanted to stay, I'm sure. And they, they, people ran out of money. And those who had more, look what do we see later, that they sold land. That's commitment, you know? I mean, you have to ask yourself if you would be that committed. To allow the community to grow in Acts chapter 2, people gave so readily just so others would be able to stay and learn and then be able to go back and be able to spread this message. These were a generous people. Are we generous? Are we looking out for individuals and say, oh, well, I, I hope things get better. I really do. Are we there to help them? Are we there to lift them up? Not just spiritually, but sometimes you need to physically pick people up, lift them up, Give them what they need. Think of others' needs before our own. One of the ways to grow as a community is sharing and giving. Number eight, we read in verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple. I mentioned a point earlier about being together physically. There's actually two points coming out of this verse here. And one is that they were in the temple daily. Why were they in the temple? They're not under the... Judaistic system anymore. They were there teaching. And it shows as a group they were doing that, weren't they? They were getting Bob and Larry and they're all going down to the temple and they're, they're, they're working. They're evangelizing. They're reaching out to people. That's what they're doing and they did it as a community. And I think that is the power that we see of the growth here is that they got together. Unless, you know, we're going to knock out the next one too, verse 9. Because uh, it's the second half of that verse in verse 46. It says, And breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. The verses on that were uh, chapter 5, verse 42, for working daily in the temple. And the one about getting together and eating, having a meal. Chapter 16, verse 34. These, there's two things mentioned in this verse, and I think, find it so beautiful. That we already saw that they were together physically, and how were they? Because they were working, they were fellowshipping, they were having meals together. You know why it's important to have meals together? So much is shared over a meal. You can't sit down next to a, another family and not carry on some type of conversation. I tell you, one of my greatest memories that I will take from this congregation was when we had a door knocking several, several quite a few years ago now, and Terry Ray had it at her house. And after we got done, we all came back to her home and we had a meal. There were over 40 people in her house. You know what they're all talking about? The door knocking. It was a beautiful thing. It was a memory that I will always carry with me. It was beautiful. Why? Because as a group, as a community, we got out there and we knocked doors. We came up with great stories. We got feedback from individuals. We had some people interested. And then when we came back, said a prayer, and we ate together, they were still talking about that door knocking. That was beautiful to see. That is how a community grows, is that we work together for the Lord, and then even in our time off, we're getting together. You know, someone, I don't remember the first time I heard this put, but it said, if you are more comfortable with people of the world than Christians, then you have a problem, don't you? If your closest relationships in this life are non-Christians, I suggest you examine your life and see if it's lining up back with number one, with the doctrine and the teaching that we're supposed to follow. There is a beauty found in the Lord's church, in the fellowship that we have, working together, enjoying the fellowship one with another. So very important. That is how relationships are built. Those connections that I mentioned with fellowship, that is how connections are made. When we see each other three times a week, yes, bonds are formed. When you stand next to, side by side someone, going out, doing the Lord's work. There were individuals here that at the wind fest, festivals that we'd get together, individuals I didn't think would come and sign up. I have better relationships now with those individuals after that because when you work side by side with someone, I would assume um, HD and others who have traveled to Jamaica, I imagine that you have a deeper appreciation for individuals that you walk those streets of Jamaica with and get God's Word out there with? Those are bonds that we form working side by side. Number 10. 
Number 10 is in verse 47. It says, praising God and having favor with all the people. That's number 10 and number 11. Number 10, we have verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 21. And favor with men is chapter 4, verse 4. If you want to write that down. Praising God. The word praising there is interesting. It can mean three things. The first one, it means it can mean to recommend. So, yes, I recommend God to you. But it can also mean a promise or an oath. And in this context, it's not exactly what it's talking about. And the one that I believe it mostly means is singing praises. And that's your fifth, your fifth act of worship. We've covered all of them in here, individually. And of all things, that singing, why is singing in there? Why did God give us this? To teach and to admonish, yes, but also it is a joyful thing. It is a wonderful thing to be able to sing praises to God because when we do that, we're lifting up our appreciation to Him. And we're also directing our hearts and our minds in service to Him. And the next passage here we have in favor with man. It could mean a couple of things, actually. The favor within the community itself grows. I like this individual even more. Why? Because we've worked together. We've had them in our home. Um, we, they, they helped us out when we had a hard time. All these different things that we just covered, we see the favor that grows within the community. The liking of one another and the, and the, the bonds of friendship that form. But it can also mean the favor of those outside. What do you mean? Because when the outside world looks into the church, and let's make it specific. When the outside world of Portland looks into this community, are they desirous of it? Do they see something different? Do they see something that they don't get in their daily lives? We know that we are told that we are to have an answer ready to anyone who asks of the what in us? The hope in us. Peter tells us that. And so the outside world should be able to look in and that should draw so many people in. It's like, you have a hope, you have an excitement, you have a zeal that I don't find anywhere else in Portland. That helps to grow this community. Now, I think I told you 12 points. Evidently, I can't count, so it's 11. But my 12th point that I will make, and it's actually not up to us. See, I planned it all along. 12 points. I know what I was talking about. The 12th point is not up to us whatsoever. And look at the last part of verse 47. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. You can't add people to Portland congregation. You can plant. You can water. And in prayer, you have to give it over to God, don't you? We can't force numbers in here. I mean, some of you big guys, you could probably pick up people and bring them in. Yes, but that's not what we're talking about. When we do all of these things, all these 11 points that I brought up, that is how the New Testament church grew back in Acts chapter 2. And all of these, this growth that we see and we read about is because they continued in these things. And it was the Lord God that added people to the church. Now, it's not wrong to pray for growth, spiritual growth, even numeric growth. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But if we pray for it, look at that list and ask, are we doing these things that they did? Those things that were by example written down so that we could know how we can grow as a community here in Portland. So as we end this lesson, I talk to the Christians first. Those in this room. If you took notes, great. If you didn't, I'll be happy to send you the list of these things. I want you to look at that list and find the one thing on there that you're lacking the most in. I know mine. I know what mine is. And start working on that today. Start working on it right away. Because if everyone in this room tonight, I don't know what we have, looks about 140, whatever it is right now, 140 individuals went home and started working on one thing right now that they're deficient in. How much stronger would this community be? Now remember that one I told you to put a star by? Go home tonight and think, is there a relationship that is strained in this congregation that I could work on? That I can help build up? If everyone in this room did that, this community here in Portland would be so much stronger. And I talk now to those who are not in Christ. We already talked at the very beginning of the lesson about the steps of salvation. We talked about how 
we could see that prior to baptism that we had obviously conviction of believing that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. By implication, we could see through Acts chapter 8, there was the confession made out loud that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. A repentance, a turning away from sin, Luke 13, 3 and 5. But of all the steps of salvation, look back in verse 41. Which one is mentioned after they gladly received the word? They were baptized. And 3,000 souls were added unto you. See, that's the important part. Not just people. It's the choice of words. Souls. Why? Because this soul is what is eternal. And tonight, if you sit here and you have not been baptized into Christ, why is that a problem? I'll tell you why that's a problem. Because it is the blood of Jesus Christ that washes our sins away. And that blood was shed for the church. Acts 20, verse 28. And you come into contact with that blood, Revelation 1, 5, when you are baptized. That is the washing away of our sins. And it was of utmost importance. What did Ananias say to Paul? Acts 22, 16. Why do you wait? Arise, be baptized. And here's the important part. Washing away your sins. Your sins are not washed away when you believe. Can't find that in the Bible. Your sins are not washed away when you repent. They're not washed away when you confess. Only Acts 22, 16 points out that your sins are washed away when you are baptized. And it's at that point, verse 41 of Acts 2 and verse 47. Souls were added to him that day, 3,000, and verse 47. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So tonight, if you are outside of Christ and you want to be a part of that community, we want to study with you. We want to show you these scriptures in greater detail. And if you want to be obedient to the gospel tonight and be baptized, you can. Whatever your need may be, come forward as we stand, as we sing.